So after watching the video of borderlands and boundaries, I want you to really think about the site and situation of Ciudad Juarez and Anapra. Um, the site is that uh, physical landscape in the desert um, along a river. The situation is where they are um, on two sides of uh, international borders, um, a large city of Juarez, a large uh, U.S. city of um, Oh, shoot, of El Paso, and how that influences the, the, uh, the life and the, the, the diffusion, the movement, the region of Juarez, or of uh, Anapra. So the lecture or the reading talked about regions. Um, formal regions are regions that are developed around some kind of uh, cultural trait, language, uh, religion, um, a vegetation type, and these are regions where the boundaries between those different types are not hard and fast. They're somewhat uh, amorphous. They've been drawn to kind of conceptualize where you're going to see, in this case, extreme desert. Um, and as you get from one edge of this, these borders toward the other uh, soil type or vegetation type, then you're going to uh, begin to see more of the other kinds. So there's a, a sort of a core and a periphery to uh, formal regions. Um, in a formal region of uh, religion, um, I wouldn't be standing in the Christian side and then jump over to the uh, Islamic side. The, the boundary between those two would sort of begin to fuse from one to the other. Functional regions are regions that are developed to uh, provide some kind of function. Um, so you could look at uh, a country like the United States as a functional region. Their borders are hard and fast. We do we fight over our borders. I can either be in the U.S. or not in the U.S., and that's really clear, a matter of just uh, millimeters on the ground. Um, there's a node where decisions are made. That would be Washington, D.C. Um, and so you can also look at it as state, so Oregon is also a functional region. We've divided the, the country into state regions. Each region has a capital where decisions are made. And this is a map of federal court systems. So um, if I commit a crime in Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, I would uh, do my, uh, do, or the judicial system would be in uh, District 9. If I am on uh, in Utah and one inch away from the Nevada border and I commit a crime, I'm still going to uh, work with the judicial system within that region 10. So functional borders, uh, functional regions, those borders are hard and fast. Uh, there's a node, so there would be a federal court building, um, and they're created for a reason. Sometimes there's conflicts when regions and uh, when political or blah, 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 formal and functional regions don't align exactly. So here is um, an example of several different uh, formal regions of religion that overlap each other um, within one functional political region. And this is, uh, you can have four distinct formal uh, regions of religion within that one uh, political region. The third type of region is a vernacular region. And these are regions where people feel a pride, feel um, a voluntary um, uh, association. So in Dixie, it's a good thing uh, if, if, you're, if you're in that vernacular region of Dixie, um, you want that name to appear on your uh, logos, you want that name in your businesses, and um, if you're in the state of Jefferson in Oregon, you want uh, Jefferson to be prominent. And so you also could have a vernacular region of the ducks and the beavers. Um, so it's just another way to kind of look at how people, uh, how culture is arranged and how to think about culture. The, the map of, um, of uh, regions of Dixie was created using what are called toponyms. So toponyms are names uh, on, of uh, cultural features that have some kind of meaning. So it could be uh, the meaning of a, an event or a battle like Battle Creek, Michigan, or it could be a, a famous person, uh, Mount Washington. And um, so by using a, a phone book, a, a telephone directory, to find out how many businesses uh, use the word uh, Dixie in their businesses, this map was created. And um, 
the, the more the word was used, uh, that was what identified kind of the heart of Dixie. And that was this uh, toponyms was used to, to create uh, vernacular regions. OK, so a lot of people had questions about diffusion. So there's uh, two major types of diffusion, expansion diffusion and relocation diffusion. Um, expansion diffusion happens rather quickly over time relative to relocation diffusion. And in expansion diffusion, the number of knowers or people who practice a new concept increases uh, significantly. In relocation diffusion, you may not have a lot of uh, new knowers of a practiced idea. So with expansion diffusion, there are two types, contagious diffusion and hierarchical diffusion. Contagion diffusion goes from uh, person to person or city to city in uh, just the next position. So if the black dot here uh, on the lower left um, of contagious diffusion is um, a small town who uh, develops some new innovation, um, it would spread to the closest towns around it and then to the closest towns around them, regardless of their size. Um, and in hierarchical diffusion, there's a leapfrogging from important town or important person to the next important town or person, kind of jumping over all the intermediary towns. And eventually, that, uh, that diffusion fills in. With relocation diffusion, you can see that uh, people move to a new place. And uh, in this example, those three people move. And they take their language, their culture with them. And not a lot of no or new knowers come from that. So um, it, over time, you can have uh, great innovations and great diffusion from uh, relocation, uh, but but they're they're subtler and they're not widespread. Okay, so uh, we did not watch the second part of boundaries and borderlands. Um, diffusion of hip hop is a great example of hierarchical diffusion started in uh, the Bronx. That's the cultural hearth where that, where that idea began. And then leaped frog to the west coast, and then um, kind of simultaneously to the Gulf area, and then spread out from there. So, uh, and then finally, I said got to Oregon a couple years ago, but that was really a joke. Um, the third. Uh, type of diffusion, so expansion, relocation, and stimuli diffusion, is this idea that you're going to keep the basic uh, function, but you may change the materials or you may change the idea a bit. So here is a mandolin from Turkey, and then uh, subsequently created in South America from an armadillo. Diffusion is not linear. Um, it has a tendency to develop this uh, S-curve of time and distance. So on the x-axis on the bottom, um, time at uh, stage one begins with nobody knowing to, to uh, increased in time. And then on the y-axis, uh, the number, the percent of the people who adopt that idea. And so stage one, there's kind of a gentle rise in, over time of people who are practicing the idea. And then in stage two, um, there's kind of a, a rapid uh, increase in the number of people who are uh, accepting the idea over a short amount of time. And then in stage three, uh, longer time, but fewer and fewer people or new people are adapting an idea. Uh, diffusion doesn't always happen. Sometimes there are barriers to diffusion. There's two types of barriers, a permeable and an, and an absorbing barrier. The permeable barrier lets a part of the idea through. Um, and it's kind of like going through a filter. So Turkey and Pakistan have both had times where they banned some of the internet. Um, not all of it, but some. So that would be an example of a permeable barrier. Uh, the other type of barrier is an absorbing barrier. And an absorbing barrier completely blocks the diffusion. Um, an example here is uh, uh, China blocked um, uh, golf courses uh, because they were too, uh, too bourgeoisie. Um, and they removed needed land resources. Also, the, the uh, Taliban uh, blocked internet and television for years. Uh, so that it would not have a negative impact on culture. 
Diffusion can be a good thing. Um, if you like the NBA, typical today there's over 212 countries um, that uh, are that watch NBA games. It's broadcast in 42 languages, um, and that's a result of globalization, and it's directly related to uh, economics. But it can also have a negative effect uh, where it can overcome uh, people's traditions, and that's one of the reasons people block or uh, try to uh, restrict uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of diffusion. Let's see, where are we going? So um, at that point, we got into mapping. Um, I wanted to show you this website about um, a couple just examples of uh, projections. And there are two projections that I just want you to be able to talk about. One is the Mercator projection, the other is the Robinson projection. And basically just the idea that the projection is uh, a way to deal with taking a spherical Earth and putting it onto a flat piece of paper. So the Mercator projection, I'm going to redraw the map, um, these circles that you see were all the same size when they were created and because they were projected in the Mercator projection, you can see that they're very distorted. So this projection is great for navigation. It's not a great projection when you want to really understand uh, land. And, and if you've ever seen the West Wing, there's a great uh, little clip about um, the, the Mercator projection being politically incorrect because in actuality it makes Iceland, or Greenland look as big as Africa, and it really isn't. Um, the other projection then is the Robinson projection, um, and the Robinson projection is what people see in thematic maps, maps of population, maps of climate. Um, and this, this map, the circles are somewhat distorted. Everything's a little distorted, but not nearly as much as you saw in the uh, Mercator projection. We talked uh, about uh, different kinds of thematic maps, um, and this is a thematic map showing population, and it's a special kind of thematic map called a choropleth map. A choropleth map has, the, uh, has a color range all in one hue, so all blue, all red, all green, supposedly, and the lighter color uh, is represented by the lighter value. The darker color is the darker value. And in this way, you can see patterns a little easier than trying to get a map that has multiple colors for each uh, legend swath. And so you can see here there's you know, a, a, a real strong uh, low population of young people in uh, the north uh, middle of the state, and the edges tend to have uh, higher populations of young people. Um, this is another choropleth map looking at percent of people living in poverty. The light yellow is fewer people in poverty. The dark, darker orangey brown is more people, uh, per, more higher percent in poverty. And so you can really see the pattern of higher poverty in the south, uh, uh, southeast part of the country. And then there's um, some along uh, the Mexican uh, uh, Texas border and into New Mexico and Arizona. So you really get to see some differences. What's interesting about something like that is you can see how um, these counties within the Midwest are kind of anomalies where most of uh, the county is uh, has few, less percent of poverty and these areas have more. Um, and it would be interesting to see whether there are cities, uh, whether there are traditionally uh, different ethnic populations uh, living in those areas. This is a dot map. It's a thematic map um, showing uh, where uh, people live who are poor but not in a metro area. So uh, each dot uh, represents 200 people. And so um, you tend to have more more poverty in metro areas, and so this was a map just looking at different spatial patterns. And so when we look at some of these spatial patterns, we're looking at um, are they clustered, are they linear, are they dispersed? So we're just trying to talk about, you know, the, the pattern is very dense, so population is more dense here as well. This is a special map called a cartogram, um, and a cartogram, I'm going to take that off of there. Um, a cartogram is 
a, a way to show information um, in, in a 3D effect or um, in, in a way where the area or the size of uh, the feature being mapped um, shows uh, visibly the, the thing you're mapping. That was badly said. But anyway, so um, on this map, the colors represent how far that uh, state or county is from, uh, or the state is from um, the Mississippi River. And then the extrusion, so how tall each state is, uh, is related to the number of cases of West Nile virus. So I get to see two things here. I get to see that West Nile virus is definitely in counties or in states that are closer to the Mississippi River. And right here, it is much higher. Uh, and that's an anomaly that's like, whoa, that's pretty interesting there. And so is that. Why is it not there? Anyway, um, another cartogram I want you to see is from the World Mapper. Um, open hyperlink. And let's just look at total population. So this map takes the total population uh, and compares it to the area of the country. So for instance, in Australia, there's a lot of area and proportionally not as many people. In India, there are a lot of people and not as much area. So the, the size or the shape of India is expanded to, to represent that. And so you can get this real sense of uh, dense populations or big populations, heavy populations, and very small uh, areas of population. So that's another cartogram. And then, um, where am I going here? The last thing I wanted to show you was a link um, to some of the maps. Nope, 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 nope. No, I didn't want to show you that at all. Hold on, one more. Let's go over here. There we go. I'll open that one. So this map, um, I used uh, some images from this map in the reading, and I used Jing to, to do screen captures of this map. But during the term, I'm going to ask you to go to some of these interactive maps and talk about them or make some inferences, grab some pictures. And so um, using your Jing screencast or Snagit if you have that, um, let me see, I'm going to go ahead and Minimize that and see if Jing will let me. Yeah. So if I wanted to capture that map and legend, I could easily uh, take a screenshot of that, copy that, and paste that in a Word document if that were part of my assignment. Um, this map is kind of fun because when you scroll over, you can see the actual data. So I'm looking at, um, I'm going to look at these composite indices. I might look at health. Um, so there's under five mortality rates. So if I look at that, uh, one of the things I'm seeing is that, um, let's see, the United States, uh, Australia, Western Europe have uh, much lower uh, under five mortality rates. Um, and then the under five mortality rates are fairly high um, in most of the African countries. So uh, by clicking on on the uh, the indices you want, it will draw the map in that way. Um, and uh, there's a bar graph that's kind of helpful, but I like I like the map itself better. So you can get detailed information about countries uh, in this way as well. Um, so just a resource that you may be using and again uh, using Jing to help with that.